안녕하세요. 한국경제신문의 김현석 유혹특파원입니다. 반갑습니다. 월가 대부분이 올해 상반기에 경기침체 그리고 유혹 증시의 약세장을 주장을 했었죠. 하지만 지난 상반기에 S&P 500 지수는 16%나 올랐고 나스닥은 32%나 뛰었습니다. 지난해 10월에 3,500까지 떨어졌던 S&P 500 지수는 어느새 4,300. 안팎에 지금 안팎까지 올라왔죠. 정말 강세장이 시작된 것일까요? 엔비디아와 테슬라, 애플 등 AI 열풍 속에 급등한 주식을 보유한 투자자들은 어떻게 해야 될까요? 약세장이 이어질 것으로 보고 현금을 많이 보유해 온 투자자라면 지금이라도 주식을 사야 하는 걸까요? 월가 유명한 리서치 펌이죠. 스트레타가스의 크리스 베론 거시 경제 및 기술적 분석 헤드를 인터뷰에 모시고 어, 현재 시장 상황 그리고 투자자들이 도대체 어떻게 해야 할지에 대해서 물어보겠습니다. And first, I will ask about the bond yield. The ten-year yield mm. is up four uh, percent, and two-year yield is about five uh, percent today. Uh, do you think our rate will continue to rise? Yeah, I do. I think this is a very important move. I mean, let's talk about ten-year yields. Mm -hmm. They've been basically directionless in this range for the last seven or eight months. This is now a decisive breakout. We've been talking about the 385 to 390 zone. Yeah. They've pushed through that pretty meaningfully here. They're about 410 as we speak. I think at a minimum, you're going to go back to the old highs, which was roughly 430 back in October. Wow. But frankly, our work would target something higher, maybe 450 or 460. The question mm -hmm. we have is, what is the impact to this on what has been a very tranquil equity environment and volatility environment over the last five or six months? My suspicion is, and perhaps today is some evidence of it, that it may create some volatility moving forward. Mm. How much? How much volatility do you expect? So let's put a couple things in perspective. Um, the move in rates has really begun when we look abroad. It started with the UK. So UK 10-year gilts were really first to move. They're back at their highs. They're actually uh, making new highs today. Mm -hmm. And we've seen about a 10% correction in the UK equity market. I, I think that's a reasonable starting point when we think about what the rest of summer and into fall could bring. 4150 on the S&P is where this market broke out from. I think it's an area to think about as a potential zone of support. Uh, when we think about the, the next several months here, just remember, you still have about three weeks of seasonal help here for markets. That begins to fade as we move into August. And I think the risk for a deeper correction is probably August or September. Hmm. Uh, but uh, Bond did have a reason since the end of March, but mega hmm. cap tax uh, have continued to outperform. Uh, they immune to raise, rising rates. I've learned something in my career doing this a long time that at the end of the day, nothing is immune to anything. And mm -hmm. it'll always be something. What I have noticed, number one, certainly large cap tech has been remarkably resilient the last five or six months. I say the last two or three weeks, though, there's some little hints of fatigue in some of those names. For example, Google has corrected uh, back down to the 50-day moving average. We've mm -hmm. seen Salesforce come in. Microsoft has stalled here a little bit. Both NVIDIA and AMD have stalled as well. So, you know, Apple and Amazon uh, and Facebook have remained strong, but there's a couple other areas where actually price action is beginning to stall. So at a minimum, mm -hmm. this very monolithic big, um, this very monolithic move in the big tech names is starting to fray here a little bit. What I would use as a guide, I know it's a different group, but pay attention to some of these European luxury stocks, LVMH, mm -hmm. Hermes, Richemont. These were very, very similar price action to what we got from big cap tech all year. Right. Those have started to falter here as well. So some of these unquestioned leaders, which have been immune to all the issues this year, I think are actually starting to show some signs of fatigue. But the mega cap tech stocks are somewhat different from the consumer discretionary because mm. uh, AI enthusiasm is, uh, I think, uh, still so hot. Uh, some say that the big tech rally is not a bubble, especially compared to the dot-com bubble in 2000. And what mm. do you think about chasing mega cap tech now? Well, it's a good question because in, in a weird way, we should actually hope it's a bubble. Mm -hmm. Bubbles are fun. Um, things go up a lot in bubbles. You make money in bubbles. I, I, I'm not convinced this is a bubble. I think this is the aftershock of the bubble from the last 10 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately rates are going to prohibit um, 
a new uh, robust bubble from forming uh, anytime soon. When I think about the AI stocks in particular, mm -hmm. particularly the big ones, names like NVIDIA or Microsoft, I do think it's notable that they have started to fatigue here. So certainly on guard for uh, continued strength, but I think at a minimum, some corrections here uh, probably make more sense. Oh, got it. And the Apple hit the new all-time highs on last uh, last mm -hmm. week, right? And yeah, that's right. Do you think that it can rise further, or does it need some consolidation? You said some consolidation, right? And yeah. I wanna, yeah, that's my best guess. I mean, Apple's clearly still the leader of this market. It's the market's largest name. I think it would be silly to stand in front of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know that ultimately in any broad correction or pullback, nothing is immune and and ultimately everything will get hit. So some some modest consolidation or weakness in Apple really wouldn't surprise me. I don't think it changes the fact that it's still a very healthy long-term chart, but you can get corrections from extended positions. And a lot of these names are in extended positions here. Hmm. And just a little bit of correction or a, it's a big, big drop down. Yeah, I think it's an important distinction to make. Um, a lot of these big tech names, the, the trends are up and the trends are higher. Mm -hmm. You can correct within trends. Mm -hmm. And I would look for anything in, say, Apple or Microsoft to be a correction within the broader uptrend. Certainly, the topping process can change our opinion of that. But these are just you know days or weeks removed from fresh highs. So I think you know, looking for more than a correction would probably be a stretch at this point. Ah, got it. And um, isn't the, the market analysis... Uh, said the uh, market breadth is uh, so narrow these days, mm. and that is the main problem. They think th because of that, uh, this is not a bull market, something like that. But uh, isn't that the recent rise in the Russell 2000, uh, a sign uh, that the market breadth is about to broaden? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's certainly been a unique feature of this market this year that the returns have been relatively narrow. Now, that's not as uncommon or as rare as you may think. Mm -hmm. Markets often get narrow, um, but it's late cycle markets that often get narrow. What's unusual about this is we've been narrow off the low. So the market bottomed last October, that was eight or nine months ago, and we've been narrowed off the low. Why that's unusual is because the first year of a new bull market tends to be the broadest. It tends to be the rising tide. It tends mm -hmm. to be the the period where most things are are rising or participating. That's not what this first eight or nine months of this uptrend have been. So that's the that's the tension. The narrowness looks more late cycle. I'd say over the last three or four weeks, there has been a hint of some broadening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're 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 um, sitting here today with about 62, 63 percent of the S and P above its two hundred day moving average. So that's certainly better than what we saw in the spring. Right. But it's not that escape velocity, rising tide, 90% of issues above the 200-day that we prefer to see. Hmm. Uh, in sum, do you think the stock market is in a bull market or is it uh, still a bear market rally? So as we said uh, on a client call recently, we said um, this is either one really long bear market rally or it's one weak new bull market. And I'm not oh. sure which of those two <laughs> is is uh, ultimately correct. Now, uh, here's how I would think about it. Our trend work, and we're trend followers, our trend work for the major indices is up. And you never want to stand in front of that. You know, we have two rules. Uh, we don't fight the Fed and we don't fight the market. Mm -hmm. And don't fight the market is more important than don't fight the Fed, right? So the trend in stocks has clearly been up. I suspect we're at a phase here where we're going to get some correction or pullback into summer and into fall. Mm -hmm. I think the character of any weakness from here is it going to be very important engaging whether this new uptrend can continue or whether something more sinister is on the horizon. I think the move in rates is a very big deal. I think rates has the potential of upsetting some of the strength we've seen in equities. We're certainly seeing that globally. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and I do think ultimately what we get from leadership of this market is going to be important. I've liked the fact that things like industrials and discretionary have led, but I'm also uncomfortable that banks are not involved here at all. And the bank stocks still generally remain pretty weak. Right. So, you know, this, this bull bear debate, I actually think misses the point. It is a very split market. There are probably things to do on both sides. Watch your back with rates higher.
Uh, do you think how much it can uh, the S&P 500 go further uh, rise or up or down this year? That's a good question. So we went back and we looked and remember the context here that this entire rally in the S&P has played out against the backdrop of an, uh, of an inverted yield curve. So I wanted to go back and see what were the largest rallies ever with an inverted curve. And there were two examples. 1979, the S&P rallied about 30% with an inverted curve. Mm -hmm. And then also mid-06 to mid-07, S&P rallied also about 30% with an inverted curve. Those were the two biggest outliers ever. So mm -hmm. if we took that 30% and we put it on last October's S&P low, mm -hmm. it gets you about 45, 50, 45, mm -hmm. 75 as kind of the top end of the range. Mm -hmm. It's also about a 21 or 22 times multiple given where earnings are right now. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's closer to the high end of the range. Mm -hmm. In terms of the low end of the range, I still would not be shocked if at some point, either later this year or into next year, you saw 3,900, 3,800. I'm not sure we're going to retest the lows. Um, even in the kind of very volatile trading range of the late 1940s, which is a parallel we like here, you ne really never undercut the lows. So I would be surprised at this point if we undercut the lows, but you could get 3,800, 3,900. Uh, uh, I think no problem, particularly if some of the big weights uh, start to falter. Mm, got it. Uh, you said uh, don't fight the tape is more important than the don't fight the Fed. Always. Yeah, <laughs> always. <laughs> but this time, Fed is so hawkish. And they yesterday I saw the minutes and there they said some some of the participants, you know, they uh, asserted the raising rate in that uh, FMC. Mm. In that case, we have to, you know, check about the Fed more. I I as I assume. Yeah. So you know, I, I think it depends on what market you're talking about because I don't think the bond market's fighting the Fed here at all. Mm -hmm. Um, when you see the move in yields, uh, the yield seems perfectly in step with a lot of the language coming from the FOMC. Mm -hmm. I think the tension is, um. How much longer can the equity market diverge from bond yields here now that they've broken out? So we went back and we looked at what were some of the best first halves to years ever. Mm -hmm. And certainly 2023 was good. Mm -hmm. uh, 1995, 1998, and interestingly, 1987 are the other three years that are pretty similar. In 95 and 98, the market kept going up in the second half of the year because mm -hmm. interest rates fell. Mm -hmm. And in 87, as we know, the market really stumbled in the back half of the year because interest rates shot higher. You had an explosion higher in yields in uh, summer and fall of 87. So I think, you know, going back to where we began, mm -hmm. this move in bond yields is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think the tension of what market has this right, uh, equities or fixed income, is going to be a lingering question as we move through the back half of the year. Mm -hmm. Economic data is uh, better than expected uh, mm. today, especially. <laughs> the expectation for the soft landing are growing. Do you think a recession is uh, likely within the next 12 uh, months? You know, it's a good question because I, I think clearly the data has probably come in better than most of the economists would suspect it will. I think that also supports rates uh, up from here. But as we say in our work, you know, rates go up until they go down. And they go up because they go up too much and then they break something. So in a weird way, the hotter the data is, the more rates go up, the more aggressive the Fed has to be, does it actually raise the likelihood of hard landing? So in some respects, I, I would actually be increasing my odds of hard landing for next year because of this move in rates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, go back to earlier this year, the um the the S&P really started to go up when Silicon Valley Bank failed in, in early March. I think the market interpreted the failure of Silicon Valley Bank as removing right-hand tail risk on interest rates. Well, it seems like we're reintroducing right-hand tail risk on rates, which I think ultimately, frankly, creates a harder economic landing mm -hmm. than the soft landing scenario. So I'm in the hard landing camp. Mm -hmm. I just think it comes later than, than many suspect. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, uh, even if a recession does occur, wouldn't it be okay for the stock market if it is uh, not so serious? Everybody expect a mild recession. You know, it's funny. 
we hear this a lot. Well, you know, Chris, what if it's just a mild recession? That's a very slippery slope. First, who's the judge of whether it's a, a mild or deep recession? And are you going to accurately make that judgment in real time? And, you know, as we've seen from markets in the past, they don't really distinguish between mild or deep recessions. For example, 1990 was a very deep recession, and the S&P only went down 20%. Mm -hmm. And conversely, 2001 was a very mild recession, and the S&P went down 50%. Mm -hmm. So the market's interpretation of events may be very different than our own. So I'm not too sympathetic to this, oh, it's a mild recession, therefore it'll be a mild decline, or it's a deep mm -hmm. recession, therefore it'll be a deep decline. I can show you examples of both where they haven't uh, really lined up as well as you might think. Oh, great, great answer. Uh, the, assume that this is the beginning of a bull market, week one, and with, uh, which industries or stocks will have the next leadership? Yeah, you know, that's really where we spend most of our time focusing not so much on whether the next 300 S&P points is higher or lower, but figuring out what are the real multi-year leaders of this market. And I know all the attention right now is on AI and tech. My attention's on industrials. I, I think the best long-term setups in this market come from the machinery and the capital goods stocks. That's true here. That's true in Europe. That's true in Asia. Uh, we've been using an acronym called EPIC, uh, E-P-I-C. It stands for uh, Eaton, Parker Hannafin, uh -huh. Illinois Tool Works, and uh -huh. Cummins Engine, EPIC. Oh, okay. That, I think, is a very important way to think about the leadership of this market coming from the big industrials. Intellectually, you can kind of come up with any justification you want for that. Perhaps it's reshoring or onshoring or rebuilding Europe or um, uh, 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 the Japanese bringing more industry home, whatever it may be. I think there's a clear message from the charts mm -hmm. that the big global industrials are long-term leaders here. Now, in the short term, they are very extended, and it wouldn't shock me if they paused or corrected here. I want to be a buyer of that weakness. They're the strongest names in our work. How do you think about uh, the bank stocks? And there is an analysis that the bank stock participated in the bull run, always in the mm -hmm. early days of all past bull markets. Yeah, it's very unusual that, you know, in the in the checklist of things that don't make a lot of sense, this would be the first move in 100 years. Mm -hmm where banks are just not involved at all mm -hmm. in uh, uh, in a new bull market. Um, the banks still act very poorly. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, when you're late in a cycle, rates up is not a particularly good message mm -hmm. for the financials. And I think the way even today I see Bank of America or Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs act, frankly, worries me. Um, these are the weakest part of the market. They're the weakest part in our work. What we've seen from the Canadian banks and the Australian banks, I also think is a little bit troubling here as well. How do you see the dollar uh, moving forward? Yeah, um, really critical moment here on dollar. And I've my whole philosophy with our work is wait for a strike and then swing. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a chance to take a swing now on dollar long. Um, in particular, I like Aussie short, I like Euro short, and I like Sterling short. Hmm. Um, not to mention, I have rate differentials that are starting to support that. So if you looked at, say, US 10s versus German 10-year yields, uh, that is moving decidedly in the favor of US dollar over Euro. Mm -hmm. I think on Sterling, it's also notable how crowded of a long that's become. So I have the chart weakening just as everyone gets along Sterling. It's a bad combination. And then I think the weakness in Aussie reflects a very, very weak picture in China. Um, so I like uh, U.S. dollar long versus uh, Aussie, sterling, and euro here. I think collectively, it's a pretty compelling case to maybe take a swing at dollar on the long side. How about the dollar against uh, Chinese yuan or Japanese yeah. yen? Yeah, we've had a pretty good call on um, dollar CNH. Um, I suspect CNH continues to weaken here, frankly. I'm not sure the yen can strengthen much as long as CNH is weakening. So given the move in rates, I think at a minimum, you're going to get yen back to the old highs. I think ultimately you could get CNH to 740, 745. Um, but all part of this story that there seems to be a move towards USD here. I think it's frankly just beginning again, and it's supported by the rate environment as well. Mm -hmm. And that means you think the Chinese uh, economic uh, is not is weak, and their stock yeah. is uh, not cheap. 
Is that right? I think the Chinese economic backdrop is still fairly perilous here. Mm -hmm. Um, What I see from the Chinese equities, what I see from the property stocks, what I see from the currency Mm -hmm. or from the Chinese rate market, I think at a minimum or oil or copper or iron ore suggest the recovery is uneven at best, but probably more realistically in need of some stimulus. And I know the Chinese have flirted with the idea of some stimulus, but nothing has really stuck yet. Thank you very much. That was my uh, last questions. Very concise and insightful answers. And uh, thank you very much. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for being with us again. Okay.